Hi everybody, welcome back. This lecture is gonna jumpstart us into a huge unit on chemical equilibrium. In fact, it's about three chapters that are wrapped up into this unit. And so this initial chapter will lay that foundation um, for you to be successful in the next two chapters. So it's really important that you really understand this material and you can apply what you've learned to more specific examples in the future chapters. So for example, this is just generic kind of chemical equilibrium laying the foundation in these next series of videos. And then the next set of videos will be about um, acid-base equilibria. And then finally, we will have a whole um, discussion on aqueous ionic equilibrium. So let's get started. Recently, we've wrapped up our discussion on chemical kinetics. Now remember, chemical kinetics was all about examining how fast a chemical reaction occurs. Now chemical equilibrium is actually going to allow us to see how far a chemical reaction goes. And this is more to do with thermodynamics. Determining if something, for example, is spontaneous or not spontaneous. Um, but that, that's a discussion we will have later on after our huge equilibrium unit together. So if you guys do go on to take physical chemistry, you will have a whole unit on kinetics and thermodynamics in great detail. Um, and then you would also have a huge unit on quantum mechanics. And so it's just something that's really important for us to understand both fields in order to understand what's going on with our reaction. So how fast a chemical reaction goes and how far it will go. And we've discussed this concept of dynamic equilibrium in previous lectures. One example was when we discussed vapor pressure. So if you remember, you have a solvent in you know, a liquid in a sealed container, and then eventually the rate of vaporization and condensation reaches dynamic equilibrium, right? Um, and so, and that's when you would measure the vapor pressure of that solvent. We also discussed dynamic equilibrium in terms of forming a solution um, with a solute and a solvent, and that the rate of dissolution versus the rate of recrystallization eventually reached dynamic equilibrium. And both of these are just processes that are taking place, like phase changes and, and, and you know dissolution and whatnot. Um, when I'm talking about dynamic equilibrium in terms of this specific chapter and go onwards, then I'm discussing chemical reactions, right? So dynamic equilibrium is defined as the rate of the forward reaction is equal to the rate of the reverse reaction. All right, now it's important to realize that once reached, the concentration of products and reactants does not change. as long as temperature is constant. I wanted to show you this figure here, the reaction we've kind of investigated before um, in a previous chapter, hydrogen gas plus iodine to produce hydrogen iodide, right? 
you can time this reaction and figure out the rate of reaction and whatnot using kinetics. Um, but we can also investigate it to see how far the reaction will go. Like, will it go to completion? And it looks like by this double-headed arrow, it will not. Anytime you see these double-headed arrows, that means this reaction's in equilibrium. That by the end, you're going to still have both reactants and products left over in your beaker. And we can see this here. If we were to plot the concentration of our reactants, and you see they do decrease over time as they react, right? They collide and then they rearrange to produce, you know, some product here. And we see that as well. But we also see that eventually their concentrations plateau, right? And that's when you've reached dynamic equilibrium. I was always, when I was, a you know, first learning chemistry um, in first semester general and chemistry class, I had this naive notion that all reactions go to completion. Like you write it that way, and that's initially how you learn many of your reactions. It's just one arrow going forward. We don't really dive into this concept of equilibrium until the second semester general chemistry, like you're taking right now in my class. <laughs> um, and so, but it's important to understand that. Um, it wasn't until I took some more classes and did some research that not all reactions go to completion. You know, sometimes I would run a reaction and I go test it out and characterize it. And I realized that half of it still had reactants that were unreacted, right? So we can quantify that. So that's using what we call the equilibrium constant. So the equilibrium constant helps us to quantify how far a reaction will go. You know by now in my class that this particular course is very data driven, um, that we are quantifying anything and everything and working with data analysis um, to, to better understand what's going on in our beaker. Okay. The equilibrium constant is represented by the capital letter K. Please do not confuse this with the rate constant we learned in chemical kinetics um, lectures, which is little k, and I always would write it as a cursive k to really distinguish between the two. So the equilibrium constant is a capital K. So if we have this particular reaction taking place, the way you would represent the equilibrium constant expression for this reaction is always products over reactants. So the concentration of C to the little c power times the concentration of D to the little d power over the concentration of A to the little a power times the concentration of B to the little b power. So always remember products over reactants. That's really, really important. And that you must have a balanced chemical equation and that those stoichiometric coefficients are at the top there right, as exponents. I see that students often forget that. So just make sure you remember that. Products over reactants here. And I'm writing it in concentration, so a lot of times we are working in molarity because we'll be looking at a lot of aqueous systems. However, we also will be investigating gases, and so there will be um, pressure units that we could also use, but that will be in a future video. I'm gonna record that one separately. Another thing to remember is that by standard, K is unitless. We never try to figure out what the specific units are for K for each um, reaction that's in equilibrium, which is another thing that distinguishes it from the rate constant. Remember with the rate constant, the units were always different um, depending on the reaction that was taking place and the order and all that stuff. Um, for equilibrium constant, you don't have to worry about reporting units. All right, so there's different ways we can represent um, the equilibrium constant. I don't want you to get confused thinking that, oh, they're different from one another. It's pretty much saying the same thing. So sometimes you'll see it written as Kc. When you have that subscript, subscript C, that's just saying that you're working in units of concentration. And then... If you have KEQ, that's just another way to emphasize that it's the equilibrium constant. So 
you'll see it, um, if it's very generic, you'll see it as KQ or just K, either one's accepted. Now, if you're working with KP, it's important to know if that's the case, then you're working in pressure units. And KP and KC are not always equal to one another. So that's why I said it's really important to know if you have a KP value or a KC value, what units you're working with. KA is going to be the next chapter for sure when we work with weak acids. And then KB is when we'll be working with weak bases. We will also be working with KSP, which will stand for the solubility product. And that's when you have an ionic compound that's not very soluble in water but is slightly soluble, just a little bit. So that will be the KSP. And then KF is formation. So we will learn at the end of this huge unit here, we'll talk about complex ion equilibria and that when they form, you look up their KF value for that formation. So just so you understand, if you see KC or KA or KSP, it's always, always products over reactants. That never changes. That subscript only allows you to recognize that what specific reaction is taking place in your beaker. That's all there is to it. Okay. One final note about the equilibrium constant is that K is always the same actually for this re for a reaction. K is always the same. At constant temperature so you'll hear me say that quite often you need to make sure you're at constant temperature because the equilibrium constant will change if it's at different temperatures but if we're at constant temperature K will be the same for that reaction regardless of your initial conditions regardless of what you're putting into your flask of initial conditions All right, um, so when you're working these types of problems, a lot of times the temperature is mentioned. Um, so you probably will not need to use that temperature anywhere in your calculations. It's only there to indicate that this data was collected at a constant temperature. Okay, I just wanted to point that out. I know sometimes when you see data, you're like, I've got to use it. Um, but that's not always the case. Now I wanted to show you an example, once again, using our favorite reaction mechanism, um, or just reaction, hydrogen plus iodine to give hydrogen iodide, right? And you can see here that we have the initial conditions and we have the equilibrium concentration. So the equilibrium concentrations is when this reaction has had enough time to reach dynamic equilibrium. And you can see that it changes from initial to final to the equilibrium conditions. And when we do products over reactants, we always end up with the same number, right, for the equilibrium constant because we're always operating here at 445 degrees Celsius. So this is very, very important. I'm going to make sure you see this here. When you write the equilibrium constant expression, and then let's say you have values to plug in to solve for the equilibrium constant, you only plug in equilibrium concentrations. You never want to plug in initial concentrations because that doesn't represent your reaction at equilibrium, right? So always, always plug in only your equilibrium concentrations. And later on, I will teach you what I call the rice table and basically R stands for reaction, I stands for initial, C stands for it changing over time, and we see reactants and products do change, but then E stands for equilibrium. And so when you use that rice table to figure out what are my equilibrium concentrations, then you will take those values and plug them into that expression here or alternatively, you will know what K is, and then you'll use this expression to solve for the equilibrium concentrations. I will teach you both ways by the end of this unit here.
All right, so let's keep moving forward. Just a final note here, because I know students always forget this, so I don't want you to forget that coefficients in the balanced re chemical reaction are the exponents in the expression. So I, you know, I shouldn't say students always forget it. I just know it's a common mistake that happens and I don't want you guys to make that mistake. So always make sure you have a balanced chemical reaction and that you use those little coefficients right in front as your exponents, okay? Just a friendly reminder. All right, so you're like, great. I'm solving for this equilibrium constant. How is this useful to me? Well, here's why. You know me, I love to give you trends and kind of give you some like, you know, relationships to remember. Remember that the equilibrium constant is equal to products over reactants. Basically, that's a ratio. Right? It's a ratio between products and reactants. And remember, our goal for understanding and studying equilibrium is to see how far a reaction will go. We want more products than reactants, right? Otherwise, we wouldn't run the reaction if we didn't desire having those products. So if you calculate K and let's say KEQ is greater than 1, does your reaction favor products or does it favor reactants? Good, it favors products. Think of it like a ratio. If I want my KEQ to be greater than one, I need to have more products than reactants. My numerator needs to be larger than my denominator here, right? So KEQ reaction favors the products. And if the KEQ is less than one, you can probably figure out that the reaction favors what? Good, the reactants. And then there are times when KEQ is close to one, you know? And if that's the case, then these are probably about 50-50, right? The concentration of the reactants is pretty close to the concentration of the product. So we have maybe about a 50-50 mixture and that happens for some reactions, right? It's really, really important that you remember these trends. So important that you do. Because a lot of times I will ask you to calculate the equilibrium constant and I will ask you, does this favor products or does it favor reactants? Or is there a little bit of both in there, right? Because if you're running an experiment, you need to know that information. If I know that 50-50 is going to be products and reactants, then I got to figure out a way to remove those reactants in the end, to purify my sample in order to just get the products alone so there's no impurities, right? So it's important for us to understand what these numbers tell us, what, you know, what do they mean to us, right? If you ever forget, if I know it gets confusing sometimes, there's a lot of information you need to know in a short amount of time, right? So I always leaned on my algebra skills to derive trends if I happen to forget or second guess myself. So as you saw me here, I said, write down first, what is the equilibrium constant expression? And you know that it's products of reactants. That's just a ratio. If I want this ratio greater than one, then this has to be larger than that, right? And so that's how I remember that favors products. If I want it less than one, then that means the denominator has to be a lot larger than a numerator. That means I have more reactants than products. And then if they're about the same, you can imagine, well, if this is 50 and this is 50, that is equal to one, right? So that's a, approximately the same concentration, okay? So make sure you um, feel comfortable with that and we will use this knowledge in the next lecture when we're practicing more problems together. So it'll be a very problem solving um, unit. So let's go ahead and make sure that you understand how to apply that knowledge to an actual problem. So this question is asking us to write the equilibrium constant expression 
So whenever you're asked to write the equilibrium constant expression, basically you're just writing the algebra equation and there's no numbers to plug in here. Um, there's no data provided here. I just want that generic expression, products over reactants. And it gives us this um, reaction here. So let's go ahead and write down our answer. So KEQ is equal, the first product I see, I'm just gonna assume that we're working in concentration right now. Like I said, I'll talk about pressure in a future video, so don't worry about that just yet. So the concentration of carbon disulfide looks like the stoichiometric coefficients one. You don't have to write the one down if that's the case. You can if you want to. Remember equilibrium constants, um, the products are multiplied. Sometimes I see students add it, so make sure you multiply. The stoichiometric coefficient for the hydrogen gas is four, so make sure you write that to the fourth power. So that's products over reactants. Methane to the first power times hydrogen sulfide gas to the second power. So there you go. That is your equilibrium constant expression for the following reaction. And just make sure, like I said, I'm going through it and at first students are like, yeah, this is easy. But the thing is, is that when you work the problems, if you get this incorrect, then the whole question is incorrect. So please, please, if it seems trivial to you now and you're like, I got this, keep practicing problems to make sure you don't develop any bad habits like missing exponents or whatnot. Because like I said, the equilibrium constant expression is going to be um, early on in these uh, big problems that you will solve later on and you don't want to get it wrong because then it messes up your math for the rest of your work. Okay, so just keep practicing. Um, let me know if you have any questions. Thank you all for watching and I will see you next time.